or so. On an October evening in 2001, I was in my hotel room in Portland, nervously preparing to deliver a lecture at Portland State University. That became my video of the truth and lies of 9-11. I, I was scared beyond words. I knew the moment was a huge one and that the words that I would speak that night would be important. It was apparent that the United States government and our economy was in the hands of criminals. It was apparent that the United States government had no honor. And it was painfully apparent to me that it was totally corrupt economics that lay it as the root cause of everything that was going so haywire. The attacks of 9-11 were little more than a month old and fear was rife in the air. I was close to being overcome by a sense of inadequacy, sure that I was not up to this task. I was almost finished getting dressed and there was a knock on my hotel room door. I wasn't expecting anybody. I opened the door to see Skip, standing quietly with his unbelievably powerful gaze. He was wearing the same native hat that you see in this picture I took of him right before his death in 2003. My name is Skip Mayhawk, he said. I'm going to be your second cameraman tonight. I had no knowledge of this, but he knew Dimitri Deslas, the student organizer who had arranged the speech. He carried a video camera on a tripod. Yet there was this power about him that I can remember to this day. It compelled me to trust and, above all, to listen. Skip stood calmly with his back to the wall of my small room as I finished getting dressed. I was trying to tie my tie nervously. He told me his story, the source of his power. Skip Mayhawk had served with the U.S. Army's 101st Airborne Division in Vietnam in 1968 in a place called the Asha Valley, where some of the bloodiest and most remembered battles of the war had taken place. Matter of factly, as though he was thinking out loud, Skip told me that he had been awarded the U.S. Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions in the Asha. And then he said that he had refused to accept the decoration because he was fighting in an unjust war. I let that sink in. There was not the slightest doubt or hesitation anywhere in his voice. It was calm, matter of fact. His refusal to accept the decoration was something a real warrior just could not and would not do because what every real warrior seeks is an honorable fight in an honorable war and to fight bravely in that fight. Then Skip told me that he had also fought beside Russell Means against the FBI and the U.S. government at a place called Wounded Knee in 1973. That, he said, was an honorable war, and indeed it was. I was taken aback by the great honor that Skip was paying me just minutes before I was to go on stage and fight my own little battle, a battle which continues to this day. I needed to learn from him. I had so many questions. His presence and his words began to calm me, and I kept looking at my watch. I was taking the stage in just a little over an hour. After some thought, I asked Skip, why is it that we can hate war so much and yet love the warriors? He did not hesitate. He said there was a time when war was about bravery. There was a time when war was about honor. In that moment, I understood why almost every true warrior I had ever met, and all those I have met since that day, carries with them in their spiritual and emotional rucksacks a great and deep sorrow. They have all behaved with honor in the face of death, but most of them have never been given an honorable or just war in which to fight. Skip's photo hangs along with the dream catcher he made for me above my bed. In 2010, a former member of SEAL Team 6 stood in my bedroom in Culver City as I pointed to Skip's picture and told the story. The SEAL cried openly, revealing his pain and the pain shared by tens of thousands of Shamar Thomases and SEAL Team members and Green Berets and soldiers and sailors and Marine Corps and airmen who have devoted their lives to being honorable warriors without once being offered the chance to fight in a just war. And what all of them carry in their hearts is the sadness at all the dishonorable, cowardly, and brutal atrocities that occurred in those wars that they served in. There is no difference between the soldiers, the sailors, the Marines, and the police department in this regard. What every good cop wants is an honest fight. But this ain't it. Some of the greatest warriors in history have been men and women who did not fight in battle as we normally think of it. They refused to fight at all in the first place once their hearts revealed to them their truths. 
There are people like Denny Morisot, like Brian Wilson, and Army Specialist Bradley Manning, who, rather than being complicit in dishonorable crimes and murders committed in, in the unjust occupation of Iraq, stood up and objected. There are warriors who have responded to the call of duty and chosen to leave the fight. And there are warriors who serve entire careers honorably, but who have never had the chance to fight in a just war. Of those, I think it's the Morisos, the Wilsons, and the Mannings who are the most powerful and the most respected. But too often, only the spirit world recognizes their bravery, while the rest of the world can neither see nor honor them. Back over my left shoulder here is an autograph picture from Dick Marcinko. Commander Marcinko was the founder of SEAL Team 6. He's widely regarded as one of, the, one of the bravest warriors in the world. Above that is a picture that I'm very proud of, of me and retired U.S. Army Master Sergeant Stan Goff. Stan was from Special Forces. He had served in Delta and taught at West Point. He's one of the most brilliant writers I've ever met. What that picture shows is me and Stan Goff going through 2,000 pages of redacted Army records that had been given to us by Mary Tillman, the mother of former pro football star Pat Tillman, an Army Ranger who was killed in Afghanistan by friendly fire. There was a cover-up of that. It was a massive crime. And as a result of those papers, the brilliant writer Stan Goff and I, as publisher and editor from The Wilderness, were able to publish a seven-part series, which exposed the cover-up and resulted in the disciplining of three general officers, six senior officers, and I believe the resignation of, of Donald Rumsfeld. I want to deliver a message to all the police officers around the world who have been supportive, to all the police officers around the world who have been helpful, who have shown restraint, who have expressed sympathy for the people that you are charged with protecting. I uh, especially want to acknowledge the San Francisco police officers who wept in, in, in front of members of Occupy San Francisco as they were ordered to and complied with the orders to take the personal property, steal it, confiscate it from members of Occupy San Francisco. I want to give this message to every police officer anywhere in the world who sees what's being directed at us in this movement and feels sick at heart and sick at their stomach. Thank you. We recognize that and I, you know, I, I'm aware of many messages where uh, the Occupy movement has had good positive encounters with police and I want to thank you for that. We appreciate that deeply. Now, you may be doing, those of you who fall in, in, into that category, may be doing your job, doing your duty, and it may be your sense of job security that keeps you doing things which you find disagreeable. But I have some news for you. At my website, CollapseNet, for more than the last year, we have documented month in and month out how hundreds of thousands of police officers around the world have been laid off due to budget cuts and austerity. In case you haven't noticed, the world economy is not getting any better. It can only go down from here. This is the collapse of human industrial civilization. And budgets are going to continue to be cut. So when the budget cuts come, you can bet that the first to be let go will be those showing any signs of honor, of compassion, of remorse, showing any signs of humanity. Because the only ones that the infinite growth monetary paradigm can afford to pay will be the most ruthless, the most brutal, the sociopathic, and the psychotic. And the pressures are going to increase on both sides for you. You're in a very tough spot because the world situation is going to deteriorate and the crowds with Occupy Wall Street are going to grow. And on the other side, the budget cuts are going to be looming and you're going to be forced into a place where you have to go inside on, sometimes on a daily basis, an, hour, an hourly basis, or a minute-to-minute -minute basis, and ask yourself, can I do this anymore? And there's going to be a lot of you who are going to be honorable like the warriors I've tried to talk to you about today, who are not going to be able to do it, and you'll stop, you'll quit, and you'll join us, and you will bring a warrior's power and a warrior's honor with you when you do. To everybody out there, to every police officer in the world who's getting off on this, who likes swinging the stick, who likes wearing the gloves and pulling hair and running people over and pepper spraying people and beating us, to all of you guys, I got news for you too. You're the bad guys. And we live in an age now that's back to where it was in Vietnam. In Vietnam, we had cameras belonging to what was then a pretty free and independent media bringing us back all the horrible images of the war, all of the crimes and the carnage. 
Well, we don't have any kind of a press like that anymore, but what we do have is what you see right now. We have cameras everywhere, we have eyes everywhere, and we have means everywhere to capture and to communicate and to put up in front of the whole world every time one of you, without honor, nakedly brutalizes and attacks an unarmed civilian exercising the right to freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. So let me close this message by repeating the words of Sergeant Shamar Thomas. It is not honorable to attack unarmed civilians who carry no weapons, who have no intent or ability to harm you. It is not honorable to suppress the right to freedom of speech and freedom of association. You carry your badges and your guns and your authority because you are charged with protecting the innocent. We are the innocent. You are working for the criminals.